have a concern for we are we are highly concerned for our remaining 32 states south carolina will end a, a little bit earlier um who will be affected by this up to maximum amounts and an urgent and an extra 95 dollars a month went to the lowest income um and so we're looking at people going from 21 to about 23 dollars a month um and so that's why we're here today we're here today to hear from food security experts across the state on what they are going to be doing in their area, in their region, and what are the best practices. So when you come out of this webinar, you'll have an idea and an action plan to make sure that the needs of your community are being met. So the first person that you'll hear from today, and before I introduce them, I just wanna say that again, feel free to utilize the chat. We'll be managing it so that we can get your questions. Um, each of the speakers will speak about, you know, between seven to 10 minutes and provide information. And then we'll open it up to you so that you can ask us as many questions that will come out of here with the resources that we need. Our first speaker is Michael J. Wilson, which is who is the executive director of Maryland Hunger Solutions. He will be followed by Cora Patel, senior manager and partnerships at Propel, who is joined by her colleague, Julieta Cuellar, who's a policy research and communications manager at Propel and Andrew Chang, who is the Director of Public Policy at Grays and Child Hunger at California. So I'm gonna turn it over to our colleague, Michael J. take it over. Thank you, Gina. Uh, and I wanna thank you and all of your colleagues at FRAC for hosting this webinar. I'm told there are hundreds of people who are here listening. And I think that speaks to the importance of the issue and the timeliness of the information that we're hoping to offer you here today. So um, thank you and, and all of your colleagues. Um, I'm gonna be briefer than seven minutes because I do wanna make sure that we leave plenty of time for questions because I know many of you have questions both, both about the federal policy and what's going on in your own states and your own regions. Uh, I wanna begin by acknowledging the, the harm that this is gonna that this is going to bring. You know, there was a policy decision made at the con congressional level to um, take money to end this program and to enable another program for next year. And while I, I may disagree with that decision, I think the impact is still really, really, really um, harmful. Um, and it's not just harmful for low income participants. Gina gave you a sense of some of the, the dollar loss that they're going to face in the face of historic food price inflation, it's also going to be damaging to the overall economy. You know, so it's not just low-income participants who lose their ability to be able to purchase food. Uh, it's going to impact grocery stores. It's going to impact farmers markets. It's going to impact everyone who, you know, who bought, who sells and produces in our overall food systems. And so this is gonna be a challenge um, across the country. And I know how big of a challenge it is in Maryland. Um, in Maryland, when we have emergency allotments and people are getting the maximum benefit, it means about a total SNAP benefits coming to our state of about $2 billion, as opposed to without emergency allotments, about $1 billion. And so that differentiation is doesn't hurt individual moms, individual kids, individual seniors. Um, it, it impacts everybody uh, across our food system and our food deserts and our food swamps and everywhere. And so we're, we're all trying to figure out how do we address this. And I know this is different than 2013 when we had the ARA boost. Uh, and one of the things I know that we looked at in Maryland at that time was dealing with the um, the, the impact on ABOTs, able-bodied adults without dependents, but there's no way to make up for the difference that's happened here. Um, I wanna focus on three major parts here that I wanna share for us to consider. And there'll be more detail about this, I know later on, both from the folks at Propel and from Andrew. Um, for those of us who are local organizations who do work in states and localities all across the country, this is both a challenge and an opportunity. So we've got to build up our own capacity because when people lose their benefits, starting at the end of February, they're gonna to look to organizations like ours. They're gonna call our toll-free number. They're gonna ask us, how come I'm only getting $40? How come I'm only getting $80 where I got hundreds before? And we've gotta be the trusted messengers who try to get out in front of that and let people know that this change is coming. 
And this change is not good, but it's coming. And we want to figure out what we can do to try to ameliorate it. We can't, we can't, we can't end all of the challenges, but we really need to try to ameliorate it. And so being trusted messengers is going to be important. Um, it's going to be important because we need to build up our own capacity to deal with these incoming calls that are going to start to come. We're going to need to build up our own expertise. So when we're looking at people trying to make deductions and what are the right kinds of deductions and how do you maximize deductions for healthcare and for medicine? How do we maximize deductions for utilities and the state standard utility allowance? How do we maximize the, the ability to, to make sure that we're getting the full housing deduction? Because all of those deductions, as you all know, are the way we get people to get the maximum allowable benefit. In every case, people's benefits are based on their household income, household size, and household expenses. And so we've got to maximize the way they do that. Uh, and that's going to be on us. Uh, we've got to work with our state agencies, but we've got to completely work to make sure that this happens. Uh, the second thing I want to focus on is advocacy. And so we need to be advocates with our state agencies so that they are out front communicating about this that they have enough capacity to respond to this, to the challenges that people are going to be having, that they can give people accurate information and that they can help, you know, push, you know, give people what they need uh, to the best extent that they can. Um, we've also got to be advocates in thoughtful ways. So I, I have to take my hat off to our colleagues in DC and DC Hunger Solutions, which does a supplemental benefit so that no one gets less than $30. They did this before the um, uh, emergency allotments. And so people who were getting the, the federal minimum of 16 were getting 30 and 30 isn't enough, but 30 is better than the 16. And so all of us need to think of ways that we can now think about how do we do a supplemental benefit from state funds. Uh, in Maryland, we now do a supplemental benefit of up to $40 of a minimum of $40 for seniors who are 62 and over. I know my colleagues in New Jersey have done a great job creating a supplemental benefit, but I think all of us know that people who we know are eligible for SNAP and who we have provided SNAP benefits, we need to make sure that they, that they can have as robust a benefit as possible. And these supplemental benefits are not, are, are not just giveaways. These are investments in their health and in their anti-hunger and their investments that get spent in our local communities at grocery stores and at farmers markets and other places. The, the last part I wanna focus on is sharing best practices. And that's why I'm so happy about this call. We, whatever we're doing that works well in New Jersey or in Maryland or some of the stuff in Massachusetts or in California, we've gotta share best practices. When the federal government has left us this way without the emergency allotments in a very short time frame. Um, we've got to make sure that state and local organizations rally together and learn from each other. So whether it's a supplemental benefit, whether it's a, a communication strategy with a state agency, we've all got to work together to address these problems because in, I know in, in our state, there'll be hundreds of thousands of people impacted, but I know there'll be millions of people impacted across the country. And so everything we can do to share best practices and be good partners for each other is really going to be valuable. Um, so I'm going to stop at that point um, and turn it over to the next speaker. And uh, thank you all for listening and for being here with us today. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to be part of this discussion. My name is Thoral, and I manage state and local policy partnerships as, at Propel, as Gina mentioned. My colleague Julieta is going to walk through some fairly sobering insights from our monthly surveys, which illustrate the kinds of impacts, household impacts, that we might see with the end of emergency allotments. But first, really quickly, for those of you who are unfamiliar, I wanted to share a little bit about Propel and providers. Propel, um, next slide, please. Propel was started eight years ago with the mission to build modern, effective, and respect respectful technology for low-income Americans to help improve their financial health. And so we make the Providers app. Next slide. So the Providers app is a free mobile app available in every state and territory. It's designed to make EBT uh, balance checking quick, secure, and easy. 
It's similar to a banking app that you might get from a consumer bank. And Providers also allows <clears throat> users to manage their public benefits side by side with other income through a free debit card, which we offer in partnership with an FDIC insured bank. Um, over 5 million, Ameri um, 5 million Americans in all states and territories use providers today. Um, and Julieta, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about our surveys. Thanks, Thoral. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'm going to be sharing um, findings that come out of a, a monthly household pulse survey that we've been running for, for quite some time. And we can compare data from as far back as September 2020 through the present. Um, all our respondents in this monthly poll survey are EBT card holders. And so each month, a random set of our, our users see an invitation in the providers app to kind of take the survey. And we get about uh, 5,000 responses, 5,500 responses each month. And the survey is a mix of multiple choice and open response questions. And we're generally asking people questions about their current um, food security housing situation, financial security, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you a better picture of who the population we're surveying is, right? We, as Thoreau mentioned, we have um, over 5 million monthly active users um, all over the country and in three territories. Um, that's about one in four SNAP um, households, we estimate that are on the platform. So we you know, often equate providers users with SNAP um, households. There are some differences, which I just wanna note here. Um, our users tend to uh, live with children under 18. Um, they're overwhelmingly women um, and they really capture the, the lowest quintile of, of income. Uh, next slide, please. So, we started, um, this is we prepare for the hunger cliff um, that SNAP households are gonna experience soon. We can look at the last year and a half as an indication of what might happen. Um, as many of you probably know, some states unilaterally ended their expanded SNAP benefits, these emergency allotments, um, of varying amounts of time ago, um, as much as over a year. And so about a year ago, we began to take a look at the difference between these states, the states that had ended these emergency allotments of SNAP and those that had it. And what we've seen very consistently is that these states that are no longer delivering um, this additional assistance had higher levels of food insecurity. So that's what I'm gonna go into now. Um, next slide, please. So households and states that are no longer issuing emergency allotments, um, have reported consistently that they're skipping meals more. So that purple line at the top um, are those states that are no longer issuing emergency allotments. Um, and you can see that there's this gap in July, the gap kind of closed, but in general, it's been a pretty substantial gap between states that are issuing these, this extra assistance and those that aren't. Uh, next slide, please. You can also see here that um, people in states that are issuing this assistance also have been reporting that they're eating less um, quite consistently. Next slide, please. Um, we also see that uh, households in these states are relying on others like family or friends for meals at higher rates. Um, and this gap has actually kind of been, it's moved around a bit, but it's been actually growing since the summer. And next slide, please. And they're also reporting visiting food pantries um, at higher rates as well. Um, I always like to take a little bit of time to share uh, our, the, the experience of people who use the Providers app in their own words too. So, so next slide, please. Um, here are just a couple of quotes from a person who uses the Providers app, who's in a state that's still issuing emergency allotments, Utah, and um, the words of a user who's living in a, in a state that is no longer issuing these, uh, this assistance. So Corey from Utah told us, SNAP program really helps me out with food every month. Whereas Candy, who lives in Kentucky, told us, I don't have money or enough food stamps to have a Christmas dinner, and I have a nine-month-old grandbaby that lives with me. Um, I think that in particular, this, the, all of this um, data, like the latest numbers that we have are from December. Um, and it's a pretty 
a hard month for, for users. There's a lot of expectations around the holidays and we frequently I sort of ask them, what are you looking forward to? What are your plans? Um, and this is a time, especially because so many of our app users are parents that they feel like they really fall short. Um, so it's a sobering time. Um, next slide, please. It's important to also just remember the broader context um, that Gina sort of alluded to at the beginning. Um, at this moment in time, and again, these numbers are from December, um, households are definitely facing higher food costs. We've been asking people for about a year now um, to rate sort of in a few categories if things cost uh, more the same or less than they did a year ago. And um, very consistently, food is what people rate the, as um, most expensive or that they've noticed um, is more expensive to cover. So in December, 91% of our households said it costs more to cover their basic monthly food purchases than it did a year ago. Um, the households that use providers are also carrying a lot of debt. Um, and in particular, credit card debt has been um, has jumped up for those that have access to it. Almost a quarter of the households that responded to the survey in December said that they have $1,000 or more in credit card debt. And housing instability has also been rising throughout 2022. Um, in December, almost 13% of households reported that they were living in unstable housing, um, basically not in an apartment or a house. Um, next slide, please. So just to sort of end on looking a little bit ahead, tax time tends to be um, you know, the moment when households that receive SNAP, the households that use the providers app, um, get the, kind of the biggest infusion of cash they'll get all year. Um, the households definitely know this, they're banking on it, it comes through in their responses, but we do know that this uh, tax season, it's gonna be less money for fewer families. Um, as many of you know, I'm sure the expanded child tax credit has expired. Um, so the child tax credit is gonna go down to its um, to a smaller amount, uh, but it also is no longer completely refundable, which means that um, fewer families are going to be um, actually to actually qualify for it. There's also not any stimulus payments that happened in 2022 to claim um, and just other forms of assistance that have expired. Um, and so that's um, just sort of an, an unfortunate thing that we're expecting to see um, households face. And like I said, you know, people are counting on it. This user, Don, who's in Pennsylvania, told us, I'm ready to get my taxes and pay off my debt. And I, you know, I'm going to do a really big shopping trip so I can stop worrying so much. Um, and that combined with the smaller amount of money to fewer people combined with rising prices and sort of this debt that people are already carrying um, just further goes to the fact that um, we're not expecting the money, uh, this cash infusion, cash infusion from tax refunds to really go as far as we've seen it in prior years. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pass it over to Thoral to wrap this up. Thank you, Lietha. So I mentioned in the chat, we are putting the finishing touches on an in-depth report this week, and we'll be sharing um, by email next week. Uh, next slide, please. So please reach out if you want to be added to this list. Um, and also just please reach out with any questions, comments, concerns. Um, we love hearing from you, and we love finding ways to support your work on the ground. So with that, I will pass it off to the next speaker. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Shane. I am the Managing Director of Public Policy for Grace um, in End Child Poverty, California. Really, really pleased to be here um, with Brack, with um, uh, Propel, and with Michael J. And, and then all of you. Um, it's really sobering to see nearly 400 people, and we know even more um, of, of you and your colleagues um, registered for this. Um, Next slide, please. I'm just gonna start with a couple of really quick um, pieces about my new organization. I, I see lots of familiar faces in the chat, but you may not know my, my new organization. So, so Grace is a part of the, the Daughters of Charity, um, which um, is uh, itself a part of um, St. Vincent de Paul. Um, and so um, we come from a, a Catholic social justice point of view. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is where the word Grace comes from in case you're interested, um, again, really, 
um, uh, complementing the, the direct service work that the Daughters of Charity do with policy advocacy. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, my wonderful director, Shemika Gaskins, um, she was in the Department of Justice in the Obama administration and um, more recently ran Children's Defense Fund in California. So um, looking to make lots of new connections in the new year. Um, and this is our, our vision. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then you know, I'd be glad to talk with folks offline um, about the work that we're doing in, in California. Lots of exciting things. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but just to finish with, um, you know, this is this is our campaign for 2023. Um, and obviously at the bottom there, you can see that food security is very much a part of, of our uh, overall uh, vision of, of economic justice. All right. Um, next slide, please. So uh, already seeing some really excellent um, uh, questions in, in the chat and the Q&A around sort of like, how big is this? What does this mean? Michael J did an excellent job. Um, orienting to us all, um, but just to, you know, just to you know, we're not going to dwell on this. But I think Michael J put it well about how harmful this cut is um, to individuals, to uh, the economy, um, and it's, it's just also never good from a policy perspective to see our programs get cut. Um, and again, we're not going to dwell on that. But um, looking forward to working with folks to um, really try and prevent this from from ever happening again. Um, but the magnitude is just really hard to overstate. Um, depending on the public health emergency, um, which is obviously tied to the conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? It's not the decision around the public health emergency where the emergency allotments come from and the Families First Act is not based purely on, on food insecurities. It's based on the conditions of, of the public health crisis. Um, and so the public health emergency is currently extended through January 11th um, tomorrow. And so we'll know very soon um, when um, Secretary Becerra of HHS um, could potentially extend it for another 90 days um, or other actions that, you know, we just don't know the future of it, but we know that because Congress legislated an end um, of February um, to the emergency allotments, as, as Gina and Michael J pointed out, we have at least a three month cut to the emergency allotments in approximately um, 35 states um, with about 75% of the SNAP caseload. Um, now in California, that is $500 million a month for at least three months. And so it's really hard to wrap your head around just how much um, grocery money is coming out of the system um, and, and how significant the hardship is, is going to be. Um, I also saw some, some questions around, you know, can you talk about this relative to SNAP benefits? The number that I think I would want folks to walk away from uh, this, but you know, I know FRAC will have other good ideas here, is that once the EAs are over, even with the, the cost of living adjustment and other adjustments that are made to the SNAP benefit, it's about $6 per person per day. So just let that sink in. On average, households are gonna lose $82 um, a month, according to the USDA. Um, that's a significant hit to your grocery budget and people are gonna be trying to eat on $6 per person per day. But just like Propel, uh, who really is the gold standard for uh, making sure that um, SNAP participants and people with lived experience on these programs are front and center, um, there was a recent, um, KQED, the, the PBS station out in San Francisco area, um, uh, talking about this impact. Um, and actually, this isn't even specifically about the EAs, but I think it really helps people show, right, when, when Propel shows us, you know, the sort of like before and after of people with and without, even with, this is, this is someone who's with the EAs in California right now, an older adult living on $1,200 a month with a special diet as she's lost member teeth. The $1,200 I have, this is her cash income, does not go far. I do receive SNAP and that has been around $300 a month, but that just does not cover the food needs. My ex food expenses have gone up astronomically in the last year. An item that would have cost me $5 a year ago is now $9 at the same store. This has become an unsustainable situation and I am now having to go to Meals on Wheels for assistance. And this is before the cut, right? And so I think that, you know, Michael J put it well around the impact that's gonna happen on CBOs and Propel right, shows that people, emergency providers are, are already stressed. And that's why we're really gonna focus on best practices to maximize the SNAP in this situation. So next slide, please. So how fast the cliff is coming, right? I mean, I think that, that Gina and Michael J already put this well, but you know, you, you'd be forgiven if this is perhaps news to you or you're signed up because you wanna learn more and you've just heard about this. So the president signed the omnibus legislation on, on December 29th, and I'm gonna be focused here on California, obviously, 
we are issuing our regular SNAP benefits on the 1st to the 10th of January. So today's the last day of our of a regular issuance. And our client information campaign is going to begin next week um, because our state, like many states, wants to give approximately you know, 60 days or the, or the maximum notice before, before this um, cut takes place. And in California, and I think in a lot of states, States, the emergency allotments actually are issued in arrears. They, they follow the, the regular issuance. Um, as you can imagine, um, states had to scramble in the beginning of the pandemic um, with this great new um, feature of the program to issue the emergency allotments, but that's in addition to their, their regular SNAP issuance. And so they sort of had to sequence things. So in California and a lot of states, but this is going to differ. So this is a great question to be asking your state if you're not aware, is when are those final emergency allotments going to be issued? So again, February is the last month, but they may actually be issued in, in March in some states. Next slide, please. So there was a question in the chat, and I know there's lots of good people who are um, who are signing up for Propel's information, which is fantastic. So I'm, I'm not sure if there's been other questions about this, but there's at least one around, you know, how are people gonna be informed? And it's important to, to understand that SNAP, like a lot of federal programs, is administered at the state level. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how um, SNAP, uh, which we call CalFresh, is administered actually at the county level in, in California. Um, and so this is just for California, but you know, if you're seeing things that you like, um, you know, these are kind of questions you could take to your state. Um, and certainly there are, there are already some best practices we're seeing from Massachusetts and other states uh, that have uh, already even gotten rid of the emergency allotments as, as um, Julieta spoke to um, that have some valuable experience as well. So here are some of the major components. So the first thing that's gonna happen next week is that texts and, and phone calls or voicemails are gonna go out following the, the January issuance. As you can imagine, states are keen to not cause panic, but provide as much time for people to prepare as possible and also not confuse people. People are not losing their SNAP eligibility, right? They're not, they're not being kicked off the program. They're losing this emergency allotment. And so the timing in California, at least, is designed to try and minimize confusion that they're not losing their quote unquote regular SNAP. Um, but as you can imagine, there's just gonna be a lot of confusion around this. So starting with text and phone calls, alerting people that they're gonna lose um, their emergency allotments. That's also not a standard number for everyone, right? As Michael J spoke to you, everyone's household um, uh, income and, and composition is, is different. And so um, while, you know, if you're already at the maximum amount, you're you're losing $95 at the sort of consistent number, but it's going to vary. And so the amount of information that's going to have to get out is is really quite significant, but trying to keep it separate from information about people's regular issuance. So later in January is the official mass notification in California, which will go out via a, a sort of flyer, a, a paper mailer um, to folks' addresses. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of folks have moved around. We're having significant storms here. So even there, there's a place to be thinking about making sure people are getting this, this information if they're able to update their information with their, their state and county. Um, they'll be updating their public facing website, which I did a screen grab of right now. It's you know trying to get more people to enroll in, in, in CalFresh and SNAP in California, but soon that uh, interface is really gonna be focused on uh, this information campaign around the end of the emergency allotments. Um, staffing up the state's call center. Uh, Michael J spoke to how significant that is. Um, we appreciate our state is trying to move proactively there. Um, and then social media, um, obviously using those channels where we know a lot of people um, get information. Uh, next slide, please. You know, as proud as we are of what California has done, um, and in my prior role, I was happy, you know, our state had developed some draft materials almost a year ago, and maybe even longer than a year ago now. Um, because this public health emergency has been extended on this 90 day notice, there were certainly times in which we thought that it might not be extended. Um, and I, I know a lot of advocates across the country have used California's draft materials to help inform their own states. Our state did a good job in getting um, feedback from um, advocates and, and assisters and CBOs. Um, I wish that I had that information to share with you today. Obviously, they're furiously trying to update it to get it ready for this campaign. Um, but like Gina said, we're so glad that FRAC is going to be a clearinghouse for this information to be sharing across across the, the country. Um, just some challenges that we're sort of monitoring and, and working to improve in real time in California. Language access. We have 17 threshold languages in California. Um, not all of the materials will, will be um, that robust, um, given now that Congress, you know, is really short in the timeline. Um, so some things will be in five languages, some things will be in 10. I'll talk about some best practices we're thinking about to try and make sure that that, that happens. Uh, you know, we get as much uh, language access as possible. Um, this is going to come on top of existing in-person and remote access challenges that I know a lot of you are tracking or are familiar with. 
Um, offices have been closed due to the pandemic, weather challenges, other issues, remote access, you know, online is not for everyone. Call centers can have long wait times, right? So this, there's going to be a, a surge on the system that's already under stress. Certainly there's lots of, um, you know, uh, impacts on our eligibility workforce over these last couple of years as well. Um, and then, you know, there's changes in other public benefits like Medicaid coming in April, um, the end of continuous um, eligibility that's going to impact a lot of the same families. And again, a lot of the same state and county staff. Um, and then if you're in a county administered state, there's um, about 10, 11 of those states in, in the country. You know, the, the good news is, is that counties will have more specific, more actionable information about, you know, uh, how to get a hold of your county uh, SNAP office, other local resources that may be available, but it, it also creates a situation in which we've got state and county information. So it can be a lot to manage. Um, and so uh, a shout out to um, Gabby Davidson at the California Association of Food Banks, who similar to FRAC at the national level here in California is gonna be compiling information from all of the 58 counties. And that I think is the best practice for those of you in other county administered states to make sure that you've got the best local information for folks. Next slide, please. Um, and again, this is just why we're focused on SNAP. I mean, uh, obviously, I think it goes without saying, you know, part of uh, people's responses will be to seek all of the resources that are available to them. Um, many of you know that I worked for the California Association of Food Banks for about eight years, and just my heart goes out to all of the, the food banks. Um, but again, I think they would be the first to acknowledge that's a system that's still at peak or, or near peak levels coming out of the pandemic. Um, and given the scale of SNAP, we're going to focus now on some best practices to uh, really maximize SNAP um, to help mitigate the hunger cliff, knowing that there are gonna be other layers of the response. Next slide, please. All right, so this is just a beginning and I, I, I'm gonna um, just move quickly through these because we do wanna get to the, um, the Q&A. Um, again, this is just you know, some pieces from California and I know there's lots of great uh, experts from across the country here. You know, number one, talk to your state. Again, uh, many of you are probably already doing that, but just in a situation where this is unfolded only over a matter of, of two to three weeks, um, you know, to be talking to your state, finding out what their plan is, trying to review materials, um, trying to figure out, you know, what that communication chain looks like, um, that would be um, uh, my, my first uh, step. But many of you are probably doing that. And if you're, if you're not doing that, also find out, you know, who you know, who are the lead advocates in your state who may already be doing that because you also don't want to have redundancy. Um, and so there may be people even on this webinar who are, are excellent points of contact for that. Uh, number two, maximize the deductions. And so Michael J mentioned this earlier. So some of the main um, deductions in SNAP are going to be critical ways for households to try and mitigate the boost. So what's happened during the pandemic is that since everyone has been bumped up to the maximum or thanks to the, the litigation, um, uh, receiving the extra, extra $95 if they're already at the maximum allotment per month, um, it's likely the case that many households have not provided all of their information on their shelter costs, on their dependent care costs, in some states, child support is a deduction, on their medical costs. Now, not all households are gonna be eligible for each of these deductions, and it's too much information to really go through on, on in a forum like this. Um, but this is the exact kind of thing to reach out to FRAC. Um, Gina is an expert in all these issues and can also help triage you to, to state experts um, who can help make sure that you are getting good information about who's eligible for these deductions and what are the right ways to maximize them. Um, so just to give one example, um, the uh, medical deduction is only for uh, those who are considered elderly or disabled under the SNAP rules. But as long as you have one such person in that household, you can claim that um, and many states have what's called a standard medical deduction. So as soon as you can verify the $35 in medical expenses, you can actually trigger a much larger medical expense deduction. And the advantage of that is it's going to boost your SNAP benefit. The same goes for making sure that households are availing themselves of all of their shelter costs, um, which is uh, not just your rent or your, your, um, your mortgage or your property taxes. There are several types of, of expenses that can qualify for the excess um, shelter deduction. Um, and dependent care. That's both for young children and for older adults um, that the, the household may have some dependent care costs for. And so, again, this is just a touchstone to say that this is one of the most important ways that you can help mitigate the SNAP benefit cliff for households. And we can get into that more in the Q&A and after this forum. Um, not only maximizing the deductions, and so when we say maximize, we mean all of the ways in which you need to help make sure households know that that's out there and get them connected. 
to their, their eligibility worker to take those deductions. And that's gonna look differently in every state, but that means having robust networks of communication through your food banks, your other application assisters, making sure that you have good county points of contact for folks. That's all the ways to make sure households know that they should be doing that and then to be driving them to the appropriate um, contact um, to make sure that they are uh, updating their information. So for example, in California, there's gonna be an FAQ document for four households, right? Again, we're not trying to cause panic, we're trying to push people to action. So one of the key action steps California is gonna urge people to do is to contact their county, again, we're county administered, to maximize their deductions. So I wish I had a sort of picture of that, but that's the sort of real world takeaway of what to do is actually find you know, and create ways um, to make sure folks are getting connected to that information and then have action steps to take it to your, your state or, or county SNAP administrators. Beyond that, there's things that you can do as an advocate um, to help simplify deductions. So one of the most important is to make sure that your state is maximizing options to allow for self-declaration of expenses. And I've had some links here. You know, in California, just to tell a quick story, you know, we typically pass legislation. Legislation is not required for this, um, but it's often what we do in California. But when we were the last state to end SSI cash out, we did a bill with an urgency clause on the housing piece to make sure that um, the legislation was implemented um, instantly. I looked, I looked it up. We had the implementing letter ready to go a month after the bill passed. And so you probably are a state that doesn't need to do legislation. Um, so there are administrative options you can do with your state. And I would, I would uh, be, um, I would think that this USDA is going to want to um, approve updates to state plans and make sure that states are proactively taking all of these options because you can imagine. You know, with all of that folks have been through with the pandemic, now with extreme weather across the country, um, they may not have the receipts um, to verify some of these expenses, but many can be um, considered um, verified unless they are um, questionable. So your rent, for example, um, and lots of other types of expenses. And so if your state's not taking those, that's a critical step you can take. Uh, maximizing waivers to streamline SNAP access. So related to the public health emergency, which is still in effect, and again, we have to watch HHS and that extension, um, there are still ways to make sure that um, telephonic access is streamlined, that the interview is um, waived in certain conditions, and then other ways to, to streamline um, SNAP access, which is going to be critical given the surge of questions um, and, and strain on the system. Um, updating your standard utility allowance. So a huge shout out to um, our Massachusetts partners um, who have done that. There are ways your state can administratively do that. Gina spoke to high utility costs. Um, and last but not least, um, enlisting your district offices, your congressional, your state reps, others who are going to have a lot of language access resources. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here so we can go to the next slide, please. Um, documenting the harm is critical. Just a shout out to the Food Bank for New York City. Michael J. mentioned some, some prior cycles where we face these kind of challenges. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A or after if people are interested. And then there is action people can take in Congress. I, I, I'll let Gina talk about um, legislation um, and uh, proactive ways to engage Congress to help uh, make permanent changes to benefit um, SNAP adequacy. Um, and some resources that I, that I referenced. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. We can end the PowerPoint and we're going to open it up for questions. And I just, again, want to reiterate my thanks to our panelists, especially those of you on the West Coast for getting super early to be with us today. Thank you for your knowledge. Um, I'm going to follow up as to what Andrew said and, and then I'll, I'll read the questions. Number one, Propel, everyone wants your report. We're going to share the registration link. And you can send it to everyone so folks don't have to be concerned that they're not going to get this amazing report. Um, but in terms of going on the same line that Andrew said and, and some of the questions is that it's important to take those data and making sure that we follow up with action steps and advocacy because the impact is real. And I, and I saw some very passionate uh, chats of like, what are we doing and what the action steps are? And, and that's what I'm going to turn it now over to our panelists. Um, and one of the questions here was, you know, what is the impact and how can we quantify the impact? Um, so I'll let our speakers unmute themselves and, and I'll jump in and interject as well. But um, is there a way to sort of um, quantify the impact that this is going to have? So uh, I'll go first, but others should feel free to weigh in. Uh, we participate with our outreach organizations, other outreach organizations in the state of Maryland. And so we get regular reports from our state agency about SNAP participation. 
So we can do the simple math of the dollars and the folks who are participating. But I think it's critical that each one of us talk to our state agencies, that we communicate with them to let them know we're concerned about this and also to get them to interact and be proactive in this situation. It shouldn't be just on local nonprofits to figure this out. It should not be. And so we should really reach out to our state agencies. They have the information, they have the data, whether they will share it with you or share it with the public, we need to make sure that we get that information. So that, that's where the information resides. Yeah, just to, just to build on that, um, I know at one point the California Department of Social Services, the SNAP agency did have a, a state specific figure on uh, what they estimate the uh, emergency allotment cut to be, if I recall correctly, it's like $219 um, a household. Um, and so I, I second what, what Michael J has said around, you know, making sure your state agency has that is sharing that information with you because they're, they are going to have the, the most, and that may be your county as well in, in the county administered system. Um, and just to build that outward from that, I think that there are other things that can be done. Obviously, Propel is documenting it, so we're also grateful and excited to learn more because you are uh, really uh, able to touch um, a significant chunk of the, of the SNAP and TANF caseloads who are on the front lines of this. And I would just add another layer to this is, um, while I certainly agree with Michael J that it's not up to CBOs, I think that there is also a unique voice that they can play when they can show, just think of all the ways in which you're going to be able to document this. You're going to have quantitative data like the spikes to your 1-800 numbers or your intake systems. You're going to have um, information if you're um, a food resource um, agency in terms of the, of the demand. Um, you may be forced to ration food. Uh, you may be forced to turn people away. Um, and um, obviously this all needs to be done um, with, with dignity and, and uh, with really centering people with lived expertise. But I'll, I know a lot of um, emergency food providers are uh, working with speakers bureaus and having um, client advocacy councils, you know, really listening to them um, and, and having them direct what this response should look like and, and how documenting the harm is done in a way um, that honors the people who, who are on the front lines. And I'll just put a link in because I don't think that I had it in my, in my slides. Um, certainly um, there are other um, ways to think about this, but just again, um, a shout out to Triada Stampas who was at the Food Bank for New York City and the work they did. If you just Google Food Bank New York City Hunger Cliff, there's at least three reports. There's the initial one they did, and then there's two following ones. And that's the last thing I'll say is that, you know, don't think about this as just one point in time happening in March. You know, I know it takes capacity, but keep documenting the harm, um, whether that's for Farm Bill or just for perpetuity. I mean, here we are singing the praises of documents that go back to 2013 because they're just as relevant as, as yesterday. Um, but they did um, like a one year later and like a still scaling the cliff. They did at least three reports. And so try and, and think about it in in that in that sense as well. I turn over to, to Propel because you all are really experts in this. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, so we have this long running survey that I mentioned um, that I think is a really helpful instrument in comparing exact events like this, the before and after um, and quantifying their impact. Um, but I mean, beyond that, we're also looking at, um, you know, beyond sort of self-reported data, trying to get it, estimate what the impact's gonna be on our, our user base in particular. Some of my colleagues were um, digging into some of our data and were estimating that um, emergency allotments account for like a third of all the SNAP benefits that um, households on the platform received on average. Um, and that, um, I think that they had estimated a an amount, an average amount. I'm not finding it now. Um, but I think it's really uh, important. Uh, some of the metrics that Andrew was mentioning, I think we'd be curious to see is just um, not just self-reported uh, information, but just um, tracking how the experience of being confused about these, this change in benefits, how people are reaching out and sort of what that response is will be really important to um, understanding how we can continuously improve communication um, and help uh, people prepare for this situation. Because inevitably, like there's always something to improve about that. 
I don't know if you have anything to add, Thoral. No, I think you covered it. Um, it's hard to quantify the impacts. And I think some of the quotes that we pull through our research and questionnaires is also really powerful to just show the sort of lived experience of the folks who are impacted most. That's all I'll add. And, and, you know, and one of the comments on the chat is like, well, what do we do? Because, you know, how do we take the sort of anger and frustration? We prepare for the farm bill and we prepare for a couple of you know, federal policy bills that, you know, Andrew sort of mentioned at, at the end, right? We we don't have the bill numbers yet, but we'll be make sure that we pass it um, along and, and give you concrete action steps once we have them. But, you know, Rep Alma bills is the perfect one, right? Because they will increase um, SNAP allotments, right? We're also thinking about Rep Gomez's bill to make sure that college students are taken care of. There's also a bill to make sure that time limits are taken care of um, and another sort of federal advocacy. Because here's the thing, um, sort of like the overlying messaging about capturing this is that when we go and negotiate our farm bill, when we go and try to get co-sponsors around this, it's important to document the harm of each of your states because we need to stick together. We need to have most of our allies stick, you know, our allies stick together and do not budge on how we need to expand SNAP, that we don't sacrifice one nutrition program for the other. That's unacceptable because it harms families at the core. We need to expand SNAP and make it as most accessible as possible. Um, I did also notice that there was a question on the chat that said, have people been notified? Like Andrew said, the omnibus was signed during the holiday. You know, most of you, I hope you took some time off and sort of came back and it's like, what just happened? So this is happening. I do want to give a shout out to some state agencies. I got to see Massachusetts in action and, and they did an amazing job. Huge kudos, huge kudos to MRI for advising them. And you know they they have already a toolkit. I'll put the website on on the chat so that people can see it. And and one of the things that we're gonna do on our frac website is that um, we're gonna have a hunger clip section. And so as your state is gathering these documents, we want to share it because there's no need to reinvent the wheel, right? Or duplicate resources. We're gonna try to post all of these up so that you have those resources. But I, I strongly encourage you to look at what Massachusetts um, is doing. It's in over 13 languages. They have sample text, media, and we'll share with that with, with folks. Um, but they did an incredible job. So to your question on the chat is, are people being notified? State agencies are doing that. One of the things I wanna flag is that a lot of people are gonna be very angry and they're sort of gonna take this out on our state agencies and it's not their fault, right? So we need to make sure that, that we talk to them because now they work through the holidays, they're trying to get an action plan. And I know some of you have better uh, relationships with their state agencies than others. Um, if, if you need more assistance on best practices and in connections, please let FRAC know how we can assist you with that. Um, but definitely let them know that you appreciate their work because people are going to be upset and they don't understand. Right? So we need to make sure that they understand that this was something that Congress did um, and it's not the state agency's fault. Um, so just wanna flag that for individuals. Um, our other question, second. Uh, While you're doing that, Gina, I would just say, um, and I'll put in the chat and a reminder that not only did our, it, was it not our state's fault, a lot of us, Advocates opposed this cut and were public against it. I had a link to that in my um, slide, but I put that in the chat too. Sorry, thanks. No, no, don't apologize. Thank you for saying that. Um, and it's really important that statewide and national advocates also do so. So kudos to Maryland Congress Solutions for California for leading yeah. the way for New York, Massachusetts and saying, this is not okay. We, we don't sacrifice our, our clients and hunger. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to mention is that we will, Thank you, Pat, for putting on the chat the link to the Massachusetts website. I do want to say that we will be releasing a report on how you can maximize your SUAs. Um, so keep uh, your standard utility allowances and how to make sure that you have them within your state. So keep an eye out for that. Um, some people are saying that um, our unhoused community, give me one second. Um, people are having issues with deductions and wanted to know what folks think about the best ways to talk to people about deductions with your state agencies and also speaking with clients. So I had said maybe we want to take that one offline just because there might be something going on with a particular county in California because they mentioned CalFresh, but just to put out there that there is a separate um, homeless shelter deduction that people should also be making sure that if folks meet the qualifications for that, there is a fairly expansive definition of what being unhoused is in SNAP. 
Um, and, and that's, that's an important part of this, of this too. I don't know what else you want to say about that, Gina. No, the, the, no, I, I think that's it. But it just in general, I know that no, all, all states do not have all of these easier medical deductions or shelter deductions and, and so on. It's not uniform. If you want to figure out what your state is doing or if you have questions on how to maximize it, again, I'm, I'm not being biased here, but again, I want to give a huge shout out to Massachusetts for the work they've done with their medical deduction, um, where they just have to self-declare that they have medical expenses and that's it. As a legal advocate, I spend many hours proving to the state agency, you know, my, my, my client's medical bills, right? And as a lawyer, that's consuming sort of think about our clients. So huge shout out to Massachusetts. Um, but here's the offer for you. If you want to know like the problem solving and the steps to have these options, please feel free to contact us. I'm going to put again my, my email. It will be in the PDF. This is what FRAC is, is trying to do to help you so that you can maximize that. But definitely the medical deduction, shelter deduction, uh, utility allowance, um, the child care deduction, which is a, a big one. And the last thing, because we're, we're getting close on time, is one of the comments that I saw there was, particularly with older adults, is we're going back to $23. We're going back to the minimum benefit. Is it worth to apply for SNAP? What are the best communication tools that we can incur so that we can encourage folks that SNAP is still a program and that they are added benefit in applying? Um, so Andrew, I don't know if you have any thoughts or Torral or Julieta. I'm just now only able to get back through a lot of the, the chat um, and just really seeing a lot of interest in a future webinar on measuring the impact, um, people interested in continuing to take collective action. Um, I think that that is exactly what we need. Um, maybe you want to talk about some of the work that you're doing with um, Adams and, and members of Congress thinking about bill reintroduction and staying proactive in the new year, in the new Congress. Absolutely. And then I'll, and I'll answer my Michael, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was. I, I think clearly the response you've gotten here is going to show that we need to continue this conversation. And so I'm, I'm going to put more work on your plate, Gina, because um, I think a month from now, we're going to have a different experience. People are going to have more, more information. They're going to have more information from talking with their state agencies. It'll be a great opportunity to continue to share more best practices uh, and also to kind of figure out how we move forward. So I, I, I was just going to volunteer more work for you, Gina. No, that's fine. And, you know, I'm at a little bit of disadvantage because I got cut off, so I can't see the chat. I only see a few of them. Um, but thank you, Andrew, for bringing it up. But I will answer the previous questions and say that, um, you know, one of the things that when we work with older adults and people who are getting the minimum benefit, one of the things that we said is like accumulated, right? Because say Thanksgiving comes around and you have accumulated close to $200 and then it's like a nice surprise because you can help. It's not the solution, right? This is not the solution. Staff benefits should be higher and this is what Rep. Adamsville will do. Um, but we want people to sign up. And in states where they have like, you know, bucks or the healthy and septus program sort of matching, um, you know, it, it's nice because people can buy fresh fruits and vegetables in those areas. So I just want to flag, and in some states, it also makes them eligible for fuel assistance and other benefits. So it opens up opportunities. Um, yes, Mike. Yeah, so what I was going to say, and I saw this question in the chat earlier, it's more important for people to sign up for benefits now than mm -hmm. ever, because now they'll still get the emergency allotments. Maybe for January, they'll get it for February, and they should not miss out on that opportunity. Um, it's going to be harder after February, but right now, it's a critical time for people to get as much of the allowable benefit as possible. Thank you, Michael. And sort of winding down, we are having um, follow-up webinars on this issue and sort of documenting the impact. They will be in February. On January 24th, which is our, our next uh, webinar that we will be having, it will be on skimming because there was one positive um, clause on the omnibus, which was some protections around skimming. So we'll have state advocates um, sort of tell you about that uh, and what they're doing in their area and what you can do in, in your area as well. Then the following month, we'll go back on the farm bill. We'll go back on these issues. We'll already have bill numbers, right? Um, we finally got a speaker late Friday. Um, so now that we have bill numbers, we'll definitely get our fact sheets and we'll have more concrete action steps. In the meantime, we will make sure we give you this recording 
We give you the PowerPoint slide, but more importantly, we will let you know when our website has been updated. So as your state starts um, doing amazing work, please share it with us. Um, you know, Massachusetts, the state agency has already agreed to share their files with us so we can share it with the public. So again, really grateful for them. Um, if your state agency also agrees as well, let us know because we want to share this, this information with individuals. And, um, and again, want to hone in on to what Michael J said, apply now. You know, it, it is ending in April, like people are going to get in some states, South Carolina and but you could still get two months like that that extra supplemental like everybody appreciates the extra money the last thing i'll say is this is the multi-partner effort contact your housing authorities contact your senior centers contact your child care providers and speak to them and let them know about this contact your city majors your legislators at the state level because they're going to call them as well we'll have sort of these best practices but definitely try to reach out to as many partners as possible because you know that we're still going to leave people out um, out of the conversations who are going to be very surprised, contact your chamber, um, right? Um, see if they're willing to sit down with retailers so that they can also help carry on the message and also carry on the message that, you know, in many states, you know, close to $90 million per state are no longer going to be available to them. And that's money that was going into the local economy. So just sort of think about which partners we're not thinking of as, as sort of carrying this message. Thank you again, everyone, um, for taking the time to spend time with us. Thank you again to our panelists for joining us and you'll get that Propel report as well as the recording and, and links. And please feel free to reach out to us anytime. Have a wonderful day.